let me introduce uh, Professor Erica Nettelhoff, the University of Maine System History Professor, housed here at Fort Kent and UMFK, and uh, who has contributed a lot to uh, senior college. Erica, we are very, very appreciative for all, all you've done and also for your willingness to do this. And I'm gonna hand it over to Erica and I'll, Erica, if you don't mind explaining to folks how you want them to ask questions. But right now what I'll do is I'll, um, if I can figure out how to mute everyone, and then I'm gonna turn Erica's back on. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I have to ask you to unmute. I'm sorry, Erica. That's all right. I, th I think I've okay. successfully unmuted, so I think we're good. So um, with that, I'm going to mute myself, and thank you again, Erica. Okay. Okay. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, this is a little odd, I guess. I'm still, even though I've been working on Zoom now since March, I'm still not a real fan. Um, so I'm hoping not to have any major tech glitches, but if I do, someone please, you know, unmute yourself and, and signal me somehow. Um, again, as Dave said, I'm Erica Nadelhaft. Um, many of you already know me since I have done quite a few senior college um, seminars and classes. Um, I'm doing this for the Holocaust and Human Rights Center of Maine, which is where I work. I am an educator for the Holocaust Center. Um, we do a number of workshops and programs for communities in Maine, and we work primarily also in the school system, um, bringing workshops about the Holocaust, about bias about racism, um, civil rights to primarily middle school and high school classes. Um, so this program, the German POW camps in Maine, is one that was actually originally, originally developed by my boss in Augusta, David Greenham, which is why when I start the PowerPoint, his name features on it and not mine. Um, but I, of course, have tweaked it to kind of fit what I like to do with it. Um, I divided the program up into two parts, um, mostly because it's on Zoom and I find about an hour is as much Zoom as I can do. And I think it's as much Zoom in the evening as I could expect anyone else to listen to as well. Um, so I don't know exactly where I will be in the presentation at the end of the hour. Um, often I get through the whole thing in an hour, sometimes I don't. Um, but I thought what I would do is just really do the presentation today and then tomorrow really sort of open it up and I won't have to share my screen and we can simply have a conversation. You, if you come up with questions, if there are things you would like to share, we can spend more of tomorrow's session doing that. Um, which might make it a little easier um, because once I share my screen, I can't see if someone's entered something into the chat. It gets a little complicated for me. So if nobody has strong objections to doing it that way, I'm going to go ahead and try and share my screen. If it doesn't work, Dave or Dawn or somebody, please unmute yourself and yell so that I know that whatever I'm doing is not working. Um, so give me a minute while I start to share my screen and pull up the PowerPoint and then I will get started. Welcome to Holocaust and Human Rights Center of Maine's Maine POW camp presentation. So at Christmas, back in 1945, a handmade certificate was given to logger Lewis Brown of Grand Lake Stream and it read, in memory of the German prisoners of war who worked with you in the woods around Grand Lake Stream in 1944 and 1945, they will always gratefully remember your kindness, helpfulness, and the fair treatment you accorded them. It was signed, as you can see, by 29 men. They were just a few of the several hundred German POWs who spent the end of the war in Maine. And I have to add as an aside, that prior to starting my work at the Holocaust and Human Rights Center, 
I had no idea we had German POW camps in the state of Maine. Never crossed my mind. So getting to do this program and getting familiar with it was actually very, very interesting for me because I knew none of this. The prisoners were housed in the former Civilian Conservation Corps camp in Indian Township. And it seems that few people remember this interesting time in Maine history. In addition, German POWs were over in Somerset County at Subumic Lake. They were in Holton at the, by the old air base. And they were in Spencer Lake, just south of Jackman. In fact, by the end of 1946, when the camps closed, more than 4,000 German POWs had been guests of the United States and the state of Maine. There were also POWs at Camp Keys in Augusta, Dow Air Force Base in Bangor, and during the harvest season, in tents at the Presque Isle Air Base. So how did all this come about? How did German POWs end up all the way up here in the state of Maine? So the story of our POW camps really begins back on November 8th in 1942 with a military offensive during the war that was known as Operation Torch. The Allies, primarily American, British, and French troops, had landed in Algeria and Morocco with the goal of advancing towards Tunis, about 800 kilometers or about 500 miles to the east. Now, the goal of Operation Torch was to corner the famous or perhaps the infamous Nazi African Corps led by General Erwin er Rommel. To some people, Rommel remains the smartest of the Nazi field generals. Now, when the attack occurred, it didn't take long for Rommel to realize that the Nazis were in trouble. They were outnumbered, they were outgunned, and they did not look to him as if they were going to be successful. So he asked for more support to be sent through Italy, but Hitler made it clear to him that no military support would be coming. So in March, he traveled to Berlin to personally apprise Hitler of the situation and to plead for more troops, but Himmler, excuse me, Hitler ignored his request and instead shipped Rommel off to oversee the coast of Greece. So on May 12th, 1943, all the Axis forces in North Africa, that was some 240,000 Italians and Germans, including most of that famed African Corps, surrendered simultaneously, all at the same time. So the story of Maine's POWs began with Operation, Operation Torch because that campaign ended with the Allies suddenly having to accommodate nearly a quarter of a million prisoners of war. So this kind of begs the question, what does an army do with 240,000 surrendered soldiers. And first and foremost, where on earth do you put them? Because it was World War II. Much of North Africa, much of Europe was a battlefield. Residents who had survived had their hands full with their own refugees, with rebuilding their own homes. They couldn't also take on the necessary care and feeding of the POWs. But the POWs had to be cared for, they had to be housed, and they had to be fed. Britain too was facing a housing shortage as a result of German bombing. So the United States was asked to help with this sudden massive influx of POWs. Now, as I'm sure you all know, the Geneva Convention, the treaty that came about after World War I, is pretty specific and clear about the care of prisoners of war. So according to the Geneva Convention, POWs could not be placed in harm's way without their consent. 
Now, since German U-boats were still active in the Atlantic and were quite capable of sinking troop ships or sinking ships with prisoners on them, prisoners had to volunteer to spend the remainder of the war in the United States. And another stipulation of the Geneva Convention was that prisoners could not be forced to contribute directly to the war effort. And so the key word here is going to be directly. But perhaps most importantly, the Allies knew that anything other than fair treatment of German prisoners of war could result in retaliation against Allied prisoners of war that were being held in Germany. But even more importantly, I guess, or another mandate of the Geneva Convention, specialized equal treat specified excuse me equal treatment for pow's meaning that if you use them for labor if they provided labor they have to be compensated for that labor and so when they are in the united states the pow's received approximately 80 cents a day in script and sort of you know fake paper money which they could then redeem at the camp store wherever they happened to be housed so in Maine, for example, the farmers and landowners who contracted with the government for the POW labor provided meals for them, as well as paying the government a set sum for each worker it provided, and also paying the POWs at 80 cents a day. But still, how did they come to Maine? Well, it turns out I'm just making sure, yeah, making sure I'm in the right place. Zoom tends to have me suddenly think, oh no, I've missed a slide. It turns out that in Maine, there were a number of lumber and paper company executives who had begun meeting with a group of powerful politicians some six months before the huge surrender in North Africa. Among them was Ralph Owen Brewster from Dexter, Maine. And the issue that they were discussing, conveniently and coincidentally, was the local labor shortage. So this is Brewster. He was a former governor. And by the way, he was also an early supporter of Maine's Ku Klux Klan. And Brewster had been elected to the US House in 1934. Now, following the, the election of 1940, he'd led a Republican sweep and moved on to the United States Senate in January 1941. Now, as you can imagine, several of Maine's industries relied really heavily on having workers in the woods to harvest lumber for the pump, pulp and paper mills. And as the war progressed, the supply of men from Maine and Canada who had traditionally worked in the woods had been severely depleted. So by the first part of the 1943 harvest season, Maine's wood industries knew that they were in trouble. And in January of 1944, Eva Bachelder, Bachelder who was a reporter for the Waterville Sentinel, wrote what is believed to be the first account of the challenges in the North Maine woods. And she wrote, in the 1942-43 harvest season, production had totaled about 40 million cords. A year later, production totaled only 20 million cords. So regardless of how much or how little you're producing, a 50% drop in one year in production is quite devastating. And this drop in lumber affected pulp at mills like Great Northern, International Paper, Maine Seaboard in Bucksport, Kennebec Paper in Augusta, St. Croix Paper in Woodland, uh, S.D. Warren, Hollingsworth and Whitney in Woodland, and the Brown Paper Company in New Hampshire. And of particular need at this time was yellow birch because yellow birch, yellow birch was being cut by the Allen Quimby veneer mill in Bingham, and it was crucial for building airplanes. Back then there were still some wooden parts made, you know, used in airplanes. And the situation in the fields in Maine wasn't much better. 
There was no one to pick the crops and the government tried to solve the problem first through recruitment. They created something called the US Crop Corps in order to get men and women to work the farms. It didn't work particularly well because most of the able-bodied adults already had jobs or simply weren't in a position to move to a farm and become a farmhand. So the government went to plan B. They tried to recruit teenagers to come in and help out, but they didn't have enough supervision to ensure that they wouldn't do more than just pick crops, if you know what I mean. So in Maine, they tried it another way. They tried to do it with just boys. They said boys and girls together are not working. Let's try with just boys as volunteers. But it turns out that even without the girls around, the boys were not particularly good at keeping their focus on the job. They even went so far as to try to encourage tourists to spend part of their vacation picking crops. And this didn't work especially well either. So within the military, there had been talk about the potential for POWs coming to the states since September of 1942. And in fact, the Army had already identified a number of existing military posts in 18 states that could potentially house as many as 50,000 POWs should the need arise. So by the time that Senator Brewster and some others had started pressing Washington about the desperate need for labor in Maine, the army already had a plan. It was true that because of the Geneva Convention, prisoners couldn't build tanks or planes or bombs because those would contribute directly to the war effort. But they could certainly cut lumber, build roads, plow fields, and pick vegetables. So suddenly, a clear plan came together. The Army could have a place to hold its growing number of POWs, and the politicians and industrial and agricultural leaders could find a solution to the labor shortage. But the planners knew there might be a conflict. Because if you think about it, for nearly four years, our nation had been fixated on and committed to destroying Hitler and the Third Reich. People had been taught to be afraid of Germany, to be afraid of Germans, to be afraid of Japan, to be afraid of the Italians. Newspapers were filled every day with stories of American boys losing their lives in places people had never heard of. And what's more, organized campaigns for buying war bonds and rationing had become the norm on the home front. Everyone had sacrificed to win the war. And why was everyone sacrificing? To keep the enemy away from our wives and children. And now suddenly, there was a plan to bring the enemy right into our own backyard. So the planners, the supporters of this idea knew that some sort of marketing campaign, a PR campaign was going to be necessary if they were gonna sell this idea to the American public and to the people of Maine. But here in Maine, we already had the perfect person to sell the plan to the state. Now, in 1937, former Somerset County Sheriff Clyde Smith had been elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. And in the spring of 1940, however, he suddenly suffered a massive heart attack and he died while in Washington. And so a successor was needed to fill his spot. But the main Republican Party didn't need to look very far to find someone who could carry out and finish out his term. It turns out that the voters elected Clyde Smith's secretary, who also happened to be his wife, Margaret Chase Smith. Now, Margaret and Clyde had met when she wrote for a weekly newspaper in Skowhegan, The Independent Reporter, which was the newspaper that Clyde Smith owned. 
Now, despite the fact that he was 21 years older than she was, they fell in love and they married in 1930. Now, Clyde Smith had spent nearly a decade in the state Senate. His arch nemesis in those years was none other than State Senator Ralph Owen Brewster, who we already talked about. Smith hated Brewster's support of the anti-Catholic Ku Klux Klan. Margaret Shea Smith, like her husband, was also no slouch. In the years after their marriage, she was elected to the Maine State Republican Board, and she was already very well known in the party. Even though she would be the first woman to represent Maine in the US Congress, her selection after Clyde's death really made a lot of sense. She could finish out her husband's term while the party decided what to do. And what they decided, of course, was that she was a natural leader. And as we all know, she rose to become one of Maine's most famous and beloved politicians. Now, given their past history, it probably wasn't easy for Senator Brewster to realize in 1944 that he should rely on the junior representative, wife of his old nemesis, to give Maine the news that the Germans were coming. But they were both smart, astute politicians. And so it was up to, excuse me, up to Representative Chase Smith to bring the news to Mainers. She did her part well in this project and the press release announcing the decision to place POWs in the Maine woods came directly from her office. This plan was really warmly received by the business leaders who, as we know, were in desperate need of assistance. The first prisoners, it was announced, would be flown into Camp Keys, processed, and then delivered to the former Civilian Conservation Corps, or the CCC, near Princeton. The camp was located, as I mentioned in the beginning, in Indian Township. And in CCC terms, it was known as the Far East Camp. Now, the Civilian Conservation Corps, CCC, was part of Roosevelt's New Deal. In Maine, as many as 100,000 jobs were created in the 1930s, building roads, schools, and all kinds of important additions and improvements to Maine's infrastructure. Perhaps the most famous CCC projects are those trails in Acadia National Park that so many of us have spent so many wonderful hours hiking on. And on either May 1st or May 8th, 1944, and for some reason there's a discrepancy about the date and I cannot find confirmation one way or the other, but on one of those days, a small convoy rolled up Route 1 and delivered 245 POWs, mostly quite young, between the ages of 14 and 20, along with their armed guards to Princeton and they marched across the bridge to the camp in Indian Township. Aside from the fence and the guard towers, the old Far East camp was just about the same as it was when it was used by the CCC. Well, ah, see, now I've gone in the wrong direction. Okay, I think I'm in the right place. The camp at Sabumuk opened soon after, and eventually POWs were in the woods working. So that took care of the labor shortage in the woods. But by midsummer, the issue of the harvest in the fields was coming around and prospects were not good. They didn't have enough POWs yet. Now, when the pea crop was ready, and this I have to, again, I have to stop and say, I knew none of this either when I started doing this research. So I immediately, you know, started, oh, really? You know, messaging my father, who's an American history teacher, and saying, did you know this? Like, why did I never know any of these things? But when the peacock crop was ready up here, some Jamaicans arrived. And my first question was, why Jamaicans? Why did we bring Jamaicans into northern Maine? Well, apparently, from 1943 to 1947, 
the United States government had recruited and transported some 70,000 Jamaicans, Barbadians, and Bahamians to the United States to work as agricultural laborers. This had come about in response to complaints by farmers that they were experiencing a labor shortage in the fields. And conveniently, I would say for us, the Caribbean islands at this time were undergoing a period of very high unemployment and a lot of social unrest. So as a result, the colonial administrations in the Caribbean were very supportive of the American plan to import labor. It solved a problem for both sides. But there weren't enough of them. And frankly, at the time, they were black and that made people nervous. So the government said, all right, tell us what else you need. And farmers said, we need hundreds more men. They first suggested to the war office that the war office provide furloughs to soldiers from the county to come back from the war to pick the crops. That was not going to happen. So the government offered an alternative. Now, people in Holton knew it would come to this. They had already had a feeling. Because in fact, in March 1944, before the first POWs ever arrived in Maine, one group in Holton had been ready for this to happen and had already made their opposition clear. And that was the Holton Grangers. The Grange officers, seen here in this picture, had a lot of concerns about the Nazi boys coming to Maine. They got the respected past master of the Grange, Albert Merritt, to sign an opposition letter to Brewster. Merritt wrote, here we go. The Holton Grange at its regular meeting held March 11th, 1944, unanimously went on record as opposed to the sending of German prisoners of war to the Holton Air Base for use in the woods or on the farms for, follow, for the following reasons. He said, the Holton Air Base is a terrible place for POWs to come because it's so close to Canada. POWs would escape to Canada from Holton and the United States could be blamed. There could be an international incident, he wrote. And also because it's obvious that there aren't enough soldiers around to pick crops, there certainly won't be enough soldiers around to guard the prisoners. Chaos, he wrote, is guaranteed. And since there aren't enough guards around, all the prisoners could possibly escape and the people of Holton would be in a constant state of terror and fear. And also, while they're terrorizing people on their way to cause an international incident in Canada, they could sabotage the war effort by burning down the airport, setting fires to trees, and poisoning wells, among other things. And they're foreigners, they don't speak English, and they come from the big cities. And finally, he concluded, even if they came and managed to avoid escaping to Canada, did not terrorize the community, managed not to burn down the forest in the air base, a typical farmhand up here works sun up to sun down about 70 hours a week. And in the woods, when the weather's right, they work about 80 hours a week and prisoners are not allowed to work that much. The Holton Pioneer Times provided their own view of the issue. It's true, they said, having German POWs in our midst wouldn't be ideal, but they saw it as a choice between three options. POWs, what they referred to as Jamaican Negroes, or no help at all. So the Pioneer Times wrote, as we see it from our observations during the past week, and of course we could be wrong, the question pretty much resolves itself into a decision of whether we are going to have labor under guard, labor against which the community would have no protection during non-working hours, or no labor at all and suffer the consequences. So in the end, of course, 
the POWs came. The people really didn't have much choice if they didn't want their crops to rot in the fields. And in fact, once the camp opened at Holton and the other camp opened in Western Maine at Spencer Lake, it, it's, whoop, I don't know why my computer just did that. So just pretend you don't see that little glitch on my screen. Um, it seems that most people nearby felt a sense of pride at having the German boys in their communities, or at least they saw some novelty. People have shared stories of brief encounters, like such as a wave to prisoners as they rode by in trucks, or hearing prisoners sing. No, no, it's not going to do anything. Hang on. Okay. Ha, ah, fixed. It. And for many of the POWs, the hard work without the daily threat of being killed was quite a welcome change. So then we could ask, what types of POWs came to Maine? Because you know, when, when you capture 240,000 troops, you're gonna have a wide variety of soldiers, you know, ordinary soldiers, commanders, hardcore Nazis, and whatnot. Who came here? There were a few prisoners who probably were truly hardcore Nazis, but most of them had been rooted out before they arrived to the United States and sent to more high security prison camps elsewhere. Some people were actually surprised that there weren't more openly declared Nazis among the prisoners. Because as you know, in Germany, the Nazi propaganda machine was tremendously successful and really all encompassing. In Germany, the Nuremberg laws had been passed back in 1935. These laws eliminated the rights and citizenship of Jews, homosexuals, convicted criminals, Jehovah's Witnesses, the mentally ill, the disabled, sometimes anyone opposed to the Nazi party. And membership in the Hitler Youth was compulsory for every boy and girl beginning at age 10 and older. So by 1944, when these prisoners of war arrived in Maine, a 20 year old German boy had already been exposed to this type of propaganda for almost half his life. And Nazi propaganda was really good. And to keep the troops inspired, Propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels regularly reminded Germans that the Nazis were on the side of righteousness. He said, we Germans are not the sort of people who beg for mercy from an enemy who is out to destroy us. We know that there is only one effective answer to British American bombing terror, and that is counter terror. And he told the troops that the enemy was hiding in bunkers and living in fear. And in some places of Europe, this was true. In Europe, this was true. But in the United States, where the, these prisoners came, the war effort was not, did not keep life from continuing. And in fact, US cities were bustling because there was plenty of work to do and not much to spend money on. People were going out to the movies. They were going out often in order to take their minds off the war. So when the German POWs got off the ships in New York or Boston, wherever they happened to land, they didn't see people hiding in bunkers. They didn't see Americans cowering in fear. They saw thriving and bustling modern cities. And they began to realize that maybe the enemy was not under siege in the way that Goebbels had suggested to most of these soldiers in the camps were just ordinary German soldiers. And for them, being a POW in America meant that they were safe, they were warm, they were fed, and they were cared for. And a lot of them actually seemed to see it as an adventure. Here's a picture of some soldiers with an aroostook farmer. Many of the former POWs have shared stories that they were told about what the consequences to them would be if they escaped from main camps. 
because they were threatened with some consequences. And they believed that they, you know, if they escaped, they would either die in the woods or somehow a rumor started that if they were caught, their papers would be stamped nach Russland to Russia and they would be sent back across to the Russian front and nobody wanted to be sent to the Russian front. So they mainly stayed put. Not a lot tried to escape. But interestingly, there were escapes. In one case, two men from the Princeton camp escaped, turned their clothes inside out to hide the PW that had been placed on their pants and shirt, and disappeared. They were eventually seen along Route 1 by a school bus driver. He asked them if they were from the prison camp. And they answered with the only English words they knew. One said yes, the other said no. So the bus driver offered them a lift. He took them to a friend's place. He asked the friend to watch them. And then he drove the bus back into town, got the police, and the escapees were returned to camp. There was another bigger escape in Indian Township, which lasted for two weeks and ended up being fairly exciting. First, the men escaped. There were six of them. Two escaped from a work site near Crawford, which is along the airline road. And the other four had escaped from Topsfield, north of the airline along Route 1. A couple of days later, it was reported that there had been several leads, hadn't found anybody. However, the authorities did pick up two hitchhikers who kind of looked like they might be the prisoners. But it turns out they weren't German soldiers. They were Canadian soldiers who had jumped ship in New York and were trying to sneak their way back into Canada. So the Canadian soldiers got a free ride the rest of the way, but were not particularly happy about it. A day or two later, the Nazi prisoners were still free and the search was broadened. About a week after the escape, two of them were caught. These were the two from Crawford. They were at a cabin owned by, a state fish and, by the State Fish and Game Commission. So basically, they'd walked along the airline road a little bit, found the cabin, and stayed there. The next day, another prisoner was caught by some people from up near Lincoln, who'd seen, they said, some strange looking guys cross the railroad tracks. They'd staked the area out, and when a man came out of the woods, they captured him. Finally, a day later, the rest of the escapees were caught. They'd traveled about 40 miles, but finally decided the only way to get anywhere was to hop on a train, so they were actually out by the train tracks looking for an opportunity. And as it turns out, they were captured on what was for them laundry day. So when the authorities arrived, all three were standing by the railroad tracks in their underwear with their clothes drying on nearby tree branches. The most well-recorded escape came in Western Maine. Three men in the Spencer Lake camp built some snowshoes out of barrel staves and wire and headed off one day into the snowy woods. And this is one pair of the snowshoes that's actually in the collection at the Maine State Museum. There's a second pair of the snowshoes at the Maine Wildlife Park in Gray, where the Maine Warden Service also has a museum. So the three prisoners, Antoine Gelb, Franz Keller, and Horst Schuster were on an ice cutting detail when they simply walked away. Wardens tracked them for four days. The wardens, of course, really knew the woods out there, and they were pretty sure the escaped POWs would follow the water and eventually be headed to the forks where the Dead River and the Kennebec River meet. And sure enough, they were captured in an abandoned river driver's shack on a knoll overlooking the forks. And although the Somerset County Sheriff, the state police, the Maine Warden Service, 
and even the FBI were involved in the manhunt. There's a sense that if you read some of these old articles, there's kind of a sense that the authorities were mostly amused by the stunt and were really simply glad that the prisoners didn't freeze to death in the woods. This is one of the wardens who captured them. Now, despite the escapes, for the most part, things at the camps went along as planned. Wood got cut, crops got picked, and men mostly stayed out of trouble. And the camps thrived in Maine for two years. And during that time, more than 4,000 POWs came to Maine, which is kind of hard to believe. But despite the fact that it became almost sort of normal in Maine to have German POWs around, no one ever completely lost track of the reasons that the German soldiers were here in Maine. And of course, the toll that World War II took on everybody. And when the war ended, some of the POW camps chose to do something that in some ways turned out to be kind of controversial. They showed what are called the atrocity films. And there were several that were put out by the War Department. And these films were mostly unedited footage of concentration camps as the Allies liberated them. And that's what the men in these pictures, in this picture, are watching. There's no direct report about these films being shown specifically in main camps. You know, we don't have any written confirmation. But it's quite likely that one was shown at Holton, at least. And again, if you've ever seen one of these films and they are available online, you will not forget the images. Now, over the years, Sabumuk and Spencer Lake averaged between 250 and 300 men until they closed in March of 1946. And this is the marker at the Spencer Lake camp there is nothing left at the Sabumuk camp. The camp at Indian Township peaked in October of 1944. It had 322 men. And at some point between September and December of 1945, that camp was closed down. And this pair of stone posts is the only remaining element of that camp. And the largest of the camps was in Holton, which at its peak in early 1946 had just over 1,600 men. That's a pretty sizable amount of prisoners in Holton. The final prisoners left Maine from the Holton camp in May of 1946, about two years after the first trucks had arrived in Princeton. And this is the stone that was placed by some of the former prisoners and community members when they came for a visit in 2003. So people stayed connected, prisoners and community members. Once the prisoners left, the camps were quickly closed and liquidated. Barracks were sold off. And they say that many of the former barracks buildings now dot the main woods as camps. These slides show a couple of houses. One is in Princeton and one is in Holton that are former barracks that are now houses. Those who were around at the time recall that there were different forms of entertainment provided for the soldiers. Sometimes dances were held for the prisoners and community members were invited. And certainly after VE Day, after Victory in Europe Day, Friday, May 8th, 1945, things loosened up considerably and there was much more mixing between community and prisoners. And there are actually plenty of examples of really lovely art and folk art that was created by the prisoners while they were here in Maine. 
The historical societies in Jackman and in Holton have wonderful examples in their collection. And when COVID is over, I would definitely like to go to Holton to see what's there. But mostly we're left with stories and recollections and letters and things like that. And there are plenty of stories about times when prisoners worked unguarded. In the camps in Holton and Indian Township, for example, things maybe got a little lax sometimes. It apparently wasn't uncommon for a prisoner of war to sneak away either under a broken part of a fence or by paying off a sympathetic guard and follow a path into town to meet with some local community members, possibly girls. And perhaps one of the sweetest stories of Maine's prisoner of war camps is of course a love story. It was between Mary Gabriel, who's seen here with her daughters, and a 23-year-old first lieutenant named Wolfgang Ritter. Their relationship lasted for nearly two months before Ritter was sent to another camp in Oklahoma. Mary Gabriel called him Molsam, which means wolf in Passamaquoddy. And Mary Gabriel went on to become one of the most, one of the more famous Indian basket makers in Maine. And she always admitted to the brief love affair, the brief love that she found with a German POW. And Ritter himself also has an interesting story. He spoke English very well. He escaped from the camp in Oklahoma and spent some time living in Indiana pretending to be Irish. He was eventually caught and he was sent to Belgium to be an interpreter for the Americans. He escaped again and he eventually returned to Germany. But in 1980, he came back to the States and he visited many of the places he'd been. So of course, naturally he decided to come back to Maine. At a party in his honor, Mary's son, Roger Gabriel, introduced himself and said he was Ritter's son. Now, Mary, Ritter had, Mary had never been able to locate Ritter, but it seems fate had intervened again. And although the news that he had a son came as a complete surprise to Wolfgang Ritter and to his wife of many years and to his children, the families became very close and Roger, who now uses the surname Ritter, I believe still lives in Indian Township. I don't believe that Wolfgang Ritter is still alive. And Mary Gabriel passed away in July of 2004 at the age of 95. Kind of a nice sort of circular story. Oh, I'm timing this just right, look at this. So in 2012, at the Holocaust and Human Rights Center, we put together an exhibit about the POW camps in Maine. And the exhibit was called Maine Boys Overseas and German Boys in Maine. And it brought together for the first time artifacts and stories from the Jackman Moose River Historical Society, from the Aroostook Historical Society and Art Museum, the Grand Lake Stream Historical Society, Fogler Library in Orono, the Maine State Museum, all sorts of other places. Because there's a lot of interesting stuff out there if you dig around for it. We have letters, we have pictures, we have, you know, we have plenty of information. And so this is a great story about Maine, of course. But it's also an interesting story about human interaction. Because here in Maine, we brought the enemy into our communities. We treated them fairly, and we treated them for the most part with respect. And in turn, they worked hard, they appreciated us, and they appreciated our treatment of them. It didn't change the horrific events, the horrific actions, you know, perpetrated on humanity by Germany and the Third Reich and their allies. But 
it was proof in a small way, I think, that even if we profoundly disagree with people, there is a way to coexist. And I would say that is a particularly important lesson in many ways for us today. So that's the end of my PowerPoint. I'm going to try to stop sharing my screen now, if I can. There we go, stop share. Okay, we're back, right? And I would say, I mean, it is close to eight. I have other bits and pieces of what I think of as miscellaneous information that, you know, I, I did this presentation um, over the summer for Penobscot Valley Senior College, and they asked really great questions that sent me scurrying to the library and to the internet and to museums to find even more information. Um, but I think since, again, we don't have all that much time left, I would save that for tomorrow. And I would also say if you have questions, comments, stories of your own, um, to maybe jot them down. And so tomorrow we can just, I won't have to share a screen. We can just have a regular conversation, discussion. You can ask questions um, and whatnot. If that sounds good to those in charge, <laughs> I would say. Don, Dave. Um, Erica, you're, you, we're following your lead and this has been fabulous. Okay. So thank you right. very much. And I can't wait till tomorrow. So okay, good. Yeah. So, and tomorrow I will have nothing formal planned. I do have, you know, sort of my backup information with all my little, you know, vignettes, I guess, that, that I, pulled, I pulled out from the museums. But really tomorrow will be about conversation and asking questions and, and all of that, if that sounds good. Sounds great. And Perfect. tomorrow morning, look for an email that says part two. That'll be your Zoom link for tomorrow night at seven. Erica, thank you very much. This was fabulous. Really okay. enjoyed it. Good. I'm glad. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Very thank good. you everyone good for joining thank us. You, Erica. Erica. Yeah. Good night, everybody. See you good tomorrow. Night. Good night, tomorrow. Okay.